Imagine you had this amazing high-tech telescope that you could point at any place in the sky and see what's thousands and thousands of light years away. What would you look at first? Would you point it at the edge of our Milky Way and see what lies beyond Jupiter? Or would you point it in the other direction and see what's at the center of our galaxy, the thing that we all revolve around? Well, of course, such an amazing telescope doesn't exist. Um, but that didn't stop the people behind me from creating an image of the center of our very own galaxy nonetheless. Um, welcome at this current affairs lecture on behalf of Rapport Reflex, Vox, and the Rapport Institute for Mathematics, Astronomy, and Particle Physics. Um, I'm very happy that so many of you uh, found your way to, to the lecture hall. Um, but also, if you're watching from home, welcome. We're glad you could make it. Um, today is all about a very exciting new, um, it, well, you could say breakthrough, um, made by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, co not collaboration. Collaboration, yeah. Um, I'm very honored to, to be joined today by this amazing group of uh, Rapout uh, scientists who are part of this collective. Um, and who are bringing us nothing less than the very first image of the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, as you can see, uh, there are a lot of members of this group here with us today, um, but they're not the complete team, so the complete team is projected behind me. Um, and first of all, congratulations, guys, on this amazing achievement of yours. Um, and a couple of them are going to tell us a bit more, and I have to move aside, otherwise you can't see. A couple of them are going to uh, tell you a bit more about this achievement, namely um, astrophysicist uh, Heino Falke, um, Raquel um, Jiménez Rosales, uh, no, that's the other way around, I'm sorry, Alejandra um, Jiménez Rosales, uh, and Raquel Fraga Encinas. Um, so first, Heino Falke will uh, give us a short lecture, um, and after which I will uh, have a conversation with the three of them. Um, afterwards, there will be time for your questions, as I can imagine, if you're anything like me, you have lots of those. Um, and if you're watching from home, uh, you can also ask your questions uh, by going to menti.com um, and using the code that's going to be projected behind me. Um, my name is Bam Teunissen. I am a, a program developer at Rapport Reflex. Um, and I'll be your moderator today. So, without further ado, I'd like to well, ask you I to... I'd first like to have a big applause for this team, actually. Yes, exactly. If that's possible, okay? So. <laughs> it's the last time they're on stage today, so I think that that was right, the, the right. moment. Yeah, no, that's fitting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now I would like to, to ask you to take your seats. Um, and Heino, the floor is yours. Thank you. And is the Menti code coming up? Oh yeah, there it is, 8686761. You have to be quick because I'm going to switch to my slides soon, and so the, the code will be gone. So it's, uh, uh, it's great to be here. Um, in fact, the second time, because we were here in 2019 talking about the first image of a black hole. And I must say, at that time, the, the room was completely filled, so there's still two or three seats. So the second time is always sometimes less exciting, it looks like. Um, but for us, it actually is, is a, a completion of a dream. And scientifically, actually, what we found now, I think, I feel personally, is actually even more relevant than, than, than last time. Last time was, you know, the big breakthrough, you know, it, it was an image. But you know, it's now we have look at the center of our own galaxy, and it's closer, it's better for various respects, in various respects. So how do you image a black hole? Well, that's how a black hole looks like. Um, on a black background, you don't see much, OK? So you, the only way to see black holes is to shine light at it. And one of the special things about special relativity, or for general relativity, is that um, that space-time can be curved, and that mass is able to, to curve space and, 
and time, so to speak. And that means that light will go around bent path. In fact, even you know, if I shoot laser beam around me, I'll curve that laser beam a tiny little bit, but so small that you cannot measure it. A black hole will curve it in such an extreme way that, in fact, light will be you know, drawn into the black hole and never come back. That's why it's a hole, right? Everything that comes too close will disappear in that hole and never come back, including light. No information, no matter, will ever come out of a black hole, at least according to the theory of general relativity. So if you shine light at a black hole, what you see is that light will be caught, will go around the black hole, and eventually will actually enter into the black hole. That also means if you look sort of a little bit at the side of this black hole, you, your light rays will go around and then you actually see this part. So you know, if I look you know, at, at the left side of Michael, if he would were a black hole, you know, I would actually see his right part or his back, um, depending where exactly I look on, on this side. So that's the weird thing about black holes. Um, it also means that they catch light at a larger radius than, than they are. And that was a little effect that I had sort of forgotten. Uh, when I initially thought about this, and then you know I saw some uh, some publications from, from from the 17, which reminded me, oh yes, this light bending actually amplifies, magnifies black holes and makes them appear larger. So we calculated how a black hole would look like uh, around 2000 uh, and made a prediction for how the center of our Milky Way should look like. Uh, you have a dark region, which we call the shadow of a black hole, and a ring of light surrounding it. Because, you know, using astrophysical models, we were predicting that a certain type of radio emission would come from directly surrounding the black hole, and you would shine light from all directions. And if you do this, if you shine light from all directions on the black hole, you actually see the shadow of the black hole, this dark region. And that shadow is actually larger uh, than the black hole itself, and what you normally would calculate, you know, the shadow appears you know, larger than the, the actual you know, event horizon size that, that you would calculate. And um, you know, that's, that's the nature of black holes. Black holes are dark. Um, they are pure space-time curvature. All the matter that has fallen into it will be condensed into a single point at the very center, or actually into a rotating infinitely thin ring, uh, if you think about it in, in classical terms. Um, so the black hole, what's left is actually just pure space-time curvature. Yeah, it's, it's nothing you can touch or feel. It's just the, the, the gravity or the, the, the curvature of, 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 you know, of space. And uh, so you can never see a black hole. You can only see its shadow, its effect on the light, the fact that light disappears. And that's a very characteristic signature of black holes, that light disappears. And that's something that we wanted to, dis uh, to see, and that's what we predicted in this paper uh, which was actually the end of a long, you know, five, six year thinking period uh, that this should be detectable. Where do you want to look if you want to look at black holes? Well, you know, people found, or we found, or astronomers found central dark objects in galaxies. And what you find is that the, the larger the galaxy, by and large, the larger the central black hole. And then there's one galaxy, M87, which became famous three years ago, which is a, the biggest galaxy in our cosmic neighborhood at 55 million light years away. And it has a, the biggest supermassive black hole candidate in the very center, six billion solar masses. And we made an image of that three years ago and published it. And that was a big breakthrough because it looked exactly how you would expect it to see, the dark shadow and the ring of light in the very, uh, uh, surrounding it. But then there's another galaxy which also hosts a supermassive black hole, and that's our own. Also, that was a huge, you know, you know, public outreach, uh, you know, reaction. In fact, it's not worse this this time. Uh, if you look at now the Milky Way, which is a normal galaxy, it had a smaller black hole. In fact, it's 1,500 times smaller, but it's also 2,000 times closer than uh, than the other galaxy. So, in terms of size, they actually both appear roughly the same same size on the sky. It also operates in a very different environment. One is a huge monster galaxy, our galaxy. It's just a normal, random, ordinary galaxy like, like we all are. And, uh, in the, uh, and it's also much less powerful. You know, black holes are, you know, can be very bright because matter falls onto it, it becomes very hot, rotates with the speed of light almost, uh, and, and radiates like crazy. So it's a, black holes are this extreme uh, um, contrast of of extreme heat and temperature and light and perfect darkness in the very center. 
You know, it, it comes very close to each other. Uh, and that also characterizes black holes. And, and this is also you know, much, much fainter, uh, much less power, 100,000 times less powerful than the other one. So completely different physical, astrophysical regime. But in terms of uh, what general relativity predicts, it should look more or less the same. And that was sort of a clear, clear prediction. Now, why do we know there's a supermassive bl black hole in the center of the Milky Way? If you zoom into the center here and switching over to near-infrared light, then what we see in the very center is a, is a big concentration of stars, actually millions of stars, where here is just one star, so a high density of stars. And if you follow them over uh, a lifetime of, 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 of 16 years, then what you see is they move. They actually move around a common center. And uh, in fact, they move on an elliptical orbit. There's one star with 5,000 kilometers per second going around the very center. And, uh, and that says, you know, there has to be a very, very compact dark mass uh, in this region. And, uh, and so we wanted to see this. And oh, let me go back. Uh, I, I pressed the button too quickly. Um, and so what we did, and you referred to this, we built a telescope which actually can look into the very heart and see what that dark object is, which actually has some radio emission. And what we do is we combine radio telescopes over the entire world into one virtual network. It takes the perspectives from all continents to actually combine together to give you the high resolution, in fact, the highest resolution in astrophysics that we have in order to see the very center. And it goes all the way from Spain to uh, Chile to the South Pole, Arizona, uh, and other places to actually do this. And actually some, uh, some of our students were there at this experiment and we did this in 2017. So the data is already five years old. It took us five years to actually, you know, really look at this data in, in, great, uh, in great detail and be confident about res our results. Now, this is now the same zoom. Now it's ch changing over to radio light. Uh, oh, this is the entire galaxy. It's bright in radio light if you, if you look at it with a radio telescope. We zoom into the very center uh, where you see this region Sagittarius A, um, which marks the central region, which was in fact identified as the center of the Milky Way by Oort uh, in the, after the war, uh, thanks to radio astronomy. And then here it is, the, the first image of the black hole in the center of our own Milky Way. You've seen it before. Um, but to me, it's always we're a moving moment. I mean, it's at the edge of the resolution, right? So it's at the, I mean, it's just what you barely can see. You know, that's, um, but it has this darkness in the center. It has this ring-like structure, and it looks pretty much like the other black hole. And that's, that's a characteristic of black holes. Black holes should be boring to some degree. In fact, black holes are the most boring objects in the entire universe. They destroy information. Whatever you throw into them doesn't matter. All, the only thing that counts in the end, how heavy you were at the end, right? How smart... Whether you're smart or stupid or, happy or, or, or beautiful or, or ugly or whatever, you, you know, what, whatever, man or woman, everything that goes in turns into how heavy you were, okay? And that's, in a way, frustrating. It's all frustrating to physicists, but that's what GR predicts, okay? And so, in the end, everything looks alike, you know? Um, and, and that's essentially what we see. Um, just briefly... It's a long image processing uh, pipeline that we used. In fact, we can actually make multiple, a multitude of images from the same data. And so we actually made thousands of images from the data uh, with in, uh, data pipelines, checked them against simulations just to make sure uh, that we were doing the right thing. And most of these thousands of images all show this ring structure, in fact, all of them, and, uh, and that was the average image that comes out in the end. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, that's part of the image processing. And then we were actually simulating. Uh, there were actually, again, millions, millions of simulations of black holes that we did. Um, well, I'm all too, almost too fast now. Um, and then we looked, now, which ones do fit to the observations? Now, the size, the shadow you see here, fits everything. But then the shape of this light uh, was taking out a number of these models, and then how they emit was taking out more of them. And then in the end, if you just look at some additional, you know, how, how, how big do they look at lower radio frequencies, there are only two models uh, out of these many models that we ran that, that sort of uh, remained. And so 
and it, it was surprising to us that we are able to model these days black holes in the computer and accurately reproduce almost all the properties that we see, uh, almost from first principles. So it's like, you know, we almost are able to do a better weather forecast for black holes than for the Earth. And, and the reason for that is we have less data, but also they are, as I said, more boring than the Earth. You know, the Earth is infinitely more exciting than black holes in terms of, you know, what the, uh, um, uh, different things that can happen there. And so the conclusion is, and that's for the experts, uh, we find that sort of there's matter falling onto the black hole. It's, it's strongly dominated by magnetic fields. Um, it produces an outflow even. There's some stuff flowing out again along the rotation axis. And the weirdest thing is that this entire black hole system points towards us. Okay, it's like the finger of God pointing at us and saying, look at me, right? So that's, uh, that was the biggest surprise. Um, the black hole itself seems to be spinning. That's something that we found. Um, and it's actually a black hole on a starvation diet, something that, you know, is a term I, I, I coined in, in, the, uh, in, in my thesis. It, it only eats roughly one moon every three, three years. Okay, so that's for a black hole, this is almost nothing. Um, um, and then there are predictions of general relativity that we can test. What you see here is the mass of an object, and here is the inferred se shadow size that you can measure. Yeah, it I mean, once you have the mass, as I said, black holes are boring. Uh, mass, you know everything, you know how big the shadow is. And we, that's for the first time we can now measure this. And that's what we measured for this first galaxy, M87. This is, you know, if you translate the measurements from gravitational wave measurements, they were like five years ago, uh, it was a big uh, excitement and even Nobel Prize assigned to this for stellar mass soup black holes here. And if you, you know, you can connect them with, with, with one line, which actually is not a fit, it's a, it's a prediction. But again, through two points, you can always fit a line, as we all know. So now we have a third point, and the third point falls again exactly on this. And so this is such a beautiful confirmation of a theory, which over a, a, a range of 100 million in terms of mass, you know, something that is... Um, and distances, you know, I mean, you, it, it, it hits, right? I've given the example at some point, you throw a dart at a dart, dart disc, right? Uh, but you can also throw darts at, at a disc, which is sort of, you know, in the center of the solar system, and you still hit, the disc will be larger. But, I mean, it, you cover all these scales from, from, your, from your basement all the way to the center of the, of the Milky Way in terms of scales, yeah? And the theory still works. Now, the conclusion we, we draw from this is that we've seen the black hole shadow now in two very different galaxies, and we are very certain now these are supermassive, supermassive black holes. I think there is a no reasonable doubt left. I mean, if, if this is a murder trial, the, 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 um, uh, the, the guy or the girl would, be, would be, uh, uh, go to jail. Uh, it's, it's a black hole. Uh, you know, general relativity works over these enormous scales from small to very large. And what's to me most exciting is, I mean, something that was pure theory, uh, you know, when I started, now becomes part of experimental science. We're doing now experimental space-time science. Now, we did particle physics, sp particle physics last century. This century, we do space-time uh, space physics and particle physics still, but, and astrophysics. But it we can study also astrophysics around black holes. You can look literally at the end of space and time. And that is, uh, it's just mind-boggling to think about it, that this is possible now, uh, within a lifetime, within a scientist's lifetime. A and personally, just as a last slide, uh, my biggest uh, success was a, a tweet with one million views. So it was this one. This was how it started. This was the prediction, how it's going. Um, and... Um, yeah, I so thought that's, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, so one million is, is pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe last but not least, it's not just this image. Uh, just to be clear, I mean, I brought this with me because Amanda uh, made this as a present for us and the minister, in fact, on, 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 on Friday. These are all the publications that came out last Thursday. So it's not just this image in front of it. It's, it's these, I haven't even counted how many pages these are. Uh, of scientific work, of entire collaboration of 300 people checking each other with different methods. I mean, some of these images were done with, with four different methods and in, 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 in different softwares and so forth. And, and, and so, you know, beyond the, the beauty and the excitement of the image, it's really very hard science. Thank you.
I was a bit speeding up. You know, she was looking at me. Did, you did wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> We're exactly on time. Good. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, I, I have so many questions, but I'm sure you also have a lot of questions. So um, let me begin by um, by maybe asking uh, asking maybe you one of you can tell me something about this. Um, so looking at that giant um, stack of papers. Um, what would you say is the first thing that um, the first door to further research that this uh, this achievement opens? Um, well, as Heino was mentioning, um, this image is the the it's the end result of many many uh, years of studying and of trying to build this image. Um, Sag A star is a source that we've known for many decades already, and we've studied it at many energies, and we had our suspicions that it was a black hole, right? Mm -hmm. But now we have this image that shows this very nice uh, bright depression at the center and then the ring. And what is um, amazing about it is that um, it looks very similar to this other giant black hole um, and its image. And so that for us is a confirmation that, you know, at these scales, gravity is the force that is acting on it and it's dominating. And even though these are two very different black holes, um, the images look very similar. And so we, are, we can be pretty certain that at the center of the galaxy, we have a black hole. Yeah. So is, is that um, a reason to, to start looking for other black holes in other places as well? Yeah, so there's... Um as uh, the EHD not only looks at these two targets, uh, so these are right now the only ones that we can actually uh, picture, make a photo of the of the black hole shadow. But we also study other sources, 3C, 279, they're um, what is called active galactic nuclei. So you can extract a lot of science from them as well, uh, picture the jets, so you cannot get as close as those photos are. And the reason is because these two sources are in the Goldilocks uh, regime, basically. Like the perfect they're, zone for... Yeah, so zone. for us, they have a, the apparent size in the sky is about the same for both of them. Um, so we're able to image them with AHD. In order to catch other sources like this and detect the black hole shadows, you will have to go into space. So not just expanding the array on Earth, which we're already doing that, and there are plans here uh, at Radboud, uh, you know, to add other telescopes in Namibia, uh, in Spain, different places around the world, but you have to go into space because what gives you the resolution, how, how much resolving power you have, is the separation between your antennas. So going into space or the moon, that's what would allow us to really um, capture other sources. So you need a lot more distance. Yes. Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> and also, I can imagine it's, that's not very, um, like, that's not on the horizon for, for some time to come. Maybe it is, I don't know. Question of money. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have this, this image of, of the center of our very own galaxy, um, do you think, uh, so, so what, what do you think there is, um, the, the symbolic meaning of this, um, or the yeah, symbolic I significance of this is? That, that was my impression, certainly after, last, um, after the last uh, release, that people had you know, felt this, is, this was not just science, it was also you know, something that did you know, something emotional with them. I mean, people told me they couldn't, couldn't sleep before the revelation of, of, of this, uh, this image. They had tears in their eyes afterwards. And it symbolized a bit the end, uh, end point, right? So this is where things are, you know, where everything is dumb. That's the last thing that will be left of the universe will be black holes. But it's, it also evokes fears of the beyond, of, 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 of death, of, of end, of destruction, so to speak. So it has a symbolic meaning. Um, and, and people are afraid of it sometimes. My own daughter told me, confessed uh, years later, that she, as a kid she was totally afraid of black holes when I mentioned them. I, she never told me then, but she, she <laughs> was. So, um, but now we, you know, we, we picture it, and so I think you know, maybe it, it, you know, it becomes more normal, and we, we, live to, we, we learn to live with it. But maybe one last thought on, on this is, it still is very special, because you know, it, it uses a huge amount of technology, the most modern te technology we have, um, and, and you think, you know, you, you can do everything. 
but you can't because you know the same picture that shows the grandness of, of technology shows you also limitations of it, the limitations of physics because we're not able to go with current physics beyond the event horizon. We cannot see what's the inside. Well, you could, but he couldn't tell us if you if you happen to go inside. So, so there is a sort of for physics, it's sort of a bit of an endpoint. That's how far you can go. You can go to the beginning of the like the Big Bang, and to the to these black holes, beginning and end of space and time. But you know, transcending is is right now seems fundamentally impossible <laughs> through measurements. You can, with, with your thought, you can always can, but with measurements, it seems to be almost impossible. And uh, yeah, so it's both. It's sort of you know a big breakthrough, but also a you know a, s a stop sign which says maybe until here, not further. Of course, physicists never care about this and they think further, yeah. but um, who knows? Yeah. So would it be fair to say that the the more you you find out about the 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 edges of of what we can measure and what we can observe, the more infinite the knowledge that we don't have becomes about the universe. Yeah, at least we can now quantify and say what we don't know. So, <laughs> and, right. and if there's new physics, I mean, it may happen at the edge of black holes. But um, whether we ever be able to to find this new physics is is also a big question. Yeah. Okay. Actually, somebody. Um, so there's, there's someone here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, first, uh, I would like to um, to do some questions of Menti because lots of them are are com coming in, um, and after that, I will I will go to uh, to the lecture hall. Um, so, somebody is wondering, and actually that's something I wondered as well, what are those bright spots in the ring? Or is that maybe a very complicated thing to, to answer? Um, I, can, I can try. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so actually the bright spots in the ring, we were actually we're not even sure they are real. So, Sag A star is, a, let's say, a small black hole. Uh, it's still very massive, about 4 million solar masses. But so there's this one, right, in our galaxy? Yes, yeah. this one. Um, and so the matter around it is changing very quickly, so on scales of minutes. So with our observations and whenever we try to make an image, we have to deal with this variability. Um, and so from all our imaging algorithms, we, as you saw, we can produce thousands of images, look similar, but they are distinct. Um, and so the image that we're presenting here is an average of all these images that enhances, let's say, uh, the, the, the parts of what most of the images have, which in this case is this depression at the center, the shadow, and then the ring. Um, and so this is one of the reasons. Now, our models also um, generate these other uh, bright spots, but we're still, uh, we're still dealing with whether or not these are how it actually is. Yeah. It's certainly an average. You know, it, it, it's yeah. an average, which means um, in, at, at any time, the black hole will look different. Every 50 minutes, it will look different. Right. And, and somebody else is wondering, um, what is it that made it, um, that made it so that you need m three more years that make it, makes it so much more difficult to capture this black hole that you need three more years to, to capture it? Um, yeah, so when we announced originally that, you know, that we had results, everybody assumed that in 2019 it was going to be SAJ, and no, it, it was M87. And the reason is because making the M87 image was a much easier process, but I don't say easy because it was an extremely complex process mm -hmm. than for M80, uh, from SAJ. Uh, the problem is, and um, Heino has mentioned it before, there are two very different black holes. M87 is uh, gigantic, uh, incredibly massive. Uh, SAJ is your, okay, your neighborhood is our <laughs> black hole, but it's a more average black hole. So things are changing because it's smaller. The material that is rotating around it is doing it uh, much faster than for M87. So things are changing rapidly. Um, so you're trying to make a picture, a long exposure picture, because we are search SAJ for you know, eight hours or so during the different tracks of something that is moving around kind of like a puppy moving around and trying to, to make a picture of that. And for M87, you have like the, um, the black hole that is not changing for like days or weeks. 
So that was one of the reasons. The second reason also, uh, nature made it more difficult for us by setting us on the arm of a spiral galaxy, and we're looking through all of this material towards our own Milky Way. Um, so there's a lot of uh, gas and things that uh, distort the radiation that is coming from, from such a star. So we had to remove all those um, uh, effects from the image. All, all the noise. Yeah, all the noise instru introduced or the services int introduced by this uh, plasma screen that affects the image. And for M87, because you're looking at uh, something where you're not looking through the arms of the Milky Way, you're uh, not having these effects. So it's a much, much complex uh, Though I would add one data thing. reduction process. One thing is uh, the main thing that this all entered in the end was the error bar. I think, you know, because, you know, if, if, if I remember like 2018. Error bar? The er you know, the error. I mean, oh, the science, error. science not about measurement, it's about the error bar. That's more important than the actual result. So knowing what your error is. And so most of, of, of what we did was trying to quantify how much do these effects affect our, our measurements and, and try to nail it down in a, in a quantitative way. We could have done that. I mean, 2018, you know, when, when, when one of my students came along and showed me the first data of M87, she showed me also that data. And so I roughly knew what the result would be. But so, so it took five years to actually quantify what we don't know, you right. know the uncertainty. Uh, so... Um, we, we could have done this probably much quicker, but then we would not have been so sure about sort of what we don't know. Mm -hmm. Also, the process of double checking, triple yes. checking, uh, doing this, uh, so the science is strong and we can stand behind this result. Yeah, that was a long process. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty clear. Um, all right, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up because uh, it's time. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here, and uh, also if, you're have you, if you have been watching from home, thank you for tuning in. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank you for your contribution and for your, for your talk um, and answering all these questions. Uh, and let's again give a big round of applause for this entire team. <laughs> Congratulations once more, and hopefully we'll see you at our and next and event. And let me thank also for the support we had from the university and, um, and, and everybody surrounding us. That was very important. We have such a wonderful department and university supporting all of us. That's also important. Yeah. Thank you.